granted, I, I just mentioned, let's see, the, the Newtonian paradigm, the radical presentism, the foundations of mathematics. There's actually something that I wanted to ask first about because I think it's really, it's particularly relevant, not just for the program you described, but for some of the material that's been discussed on the podcast recently. Because like I mentioned with Sean Carroll and David Albert, we talked about fine tuning and fine tuning has come up a lot. And many of the physicists that I've spoken with, particularly string theorists, have endorsed multiverse accounts of cosmology to account for fine tuning. So one of the most important, I think, bedrocks of your work with Roberto that you do agree upon in the introduction is something that you refer to as the principle of the singular existence of the universe. So I thought maybe I might ask you if you could explain this principle. Well, it comes directly from Leibniz. And the idea is that we want to force ourselves to think. Hold on. I just did. Um, If you ever have to take pills every three hours, don't tell your family. (laughs) Because everybody comes in a row to line up to tell you. Um, it's, it seems to me, I, I, could, I, I know there's an argument, and I could we'll put together the argument if you want, but the vision of the universe that we want is one which has as much variety and, dare I use the word, freedom in its construction And it's very different. I think we cosmologists get into a bad habit early in our careers of playing with model cosmologies, which have lots of symmetries, lots of regularities, and not much variety. So we always study cosmological models like Freeman Robinson Walker, which are perfectly round or perfectly toroidal or something like that. And those are, those models, they are solutions formally of the Einstein equations. But if you actually give a really correct version of the Einstein equations and ask what they apply to, the solution set lives in a space of diffeomorphic, diffeomorphism in varying states. And diffeomorphism in varying states are those that every neighborhood of every event or point can be distinguished from any other one by observables you would be able to measure or observe near every point. So so the Schwarzschild solution, the other solutions I've been mentioning, just don't mean anything. They're not part of the physical theory of general relativity for the cosmological case where you have closed boundaries and you have no asymptotics. And that's just true. And it's been true for, you know, Einstein understood that. And it means that we rule out all the solutions that we got used to studying are models which have no physical reality and in a way that matters very much. And I think that's done tremendous damage to the practice of theoretical cosmology. So and we can talk much more about that, but I think it's essential to start with that point. So, for example, when 90-something percent of the papers by my friends, and they are my friends, String theorists are about solutions which have a certain symmetry called anti asymptotic anti And those solutions do not exist in the state space of real solutions to general relativity. So it's not, it's, it's a lot of bad habits have evolved and the bad habits of thought where people use these non existent solutions as examples. Hmm. Does this relate at all to your position 
on the foundations of mathematics and the role of mathematics in physics because one thing that I yeah one thing that I picked up on reading um, is that you think one of the ways that mathematics has been so important to physics is that it provides this huge space of models that can mirror physical reality. Right, and but you you've got to be careful that your space of models doesn't. I mean, the problem is that the diffeomorphism invariance is not a small thing. The theory of general relativity cannot has no solutions, cannot be solved, is is not consistent mathematically unless you restrict it in this way. Hmm. Well, maybe more more explicitly asking or moving towards the philosophy of mathematics i don't or i don't recall ever reading a physicist who felt that having a very well spelled out positions on the philosophical foundations of mathematics was so important to an ultimate theory of cosmology but here it is i mean front and center in your work why why do you take it as so relevant to a theory of cosmology if, on your view, mathematical objects don't have a physical existence? Well, first, thank you. That's a huge compliment. Um, and I'm certainly not done. That's the first thing, the second thing I ever write uh, related to the foundations of mathematics. And I've got a long way. I mean, I, ha I have, of course, an independent interest in the question. And the questions of foundations of mathematics are very interesting to me in general, and to try to work out some sort of position, let me call it very much a first position, on the foundational questions in mathematics is, is very interesting. And I don't, I, I, they're hard questions, they're really hard questions. But I don't think that the right answer is in the ballpark of Platonism. And, um, one way, I mean, this is when we were working with Roberto, and this is a thought, you know, one morning in passing during that, but I think it's had a big influence on me. Um, the what, what I and I think many people in physics used to believe is that there, there what, um, what's his name called the mirror of reality, that, that there was a mathematical system in the sense of a, a, a system spelled out by a list of assumptions, which had a one-to-one -one correspondence with physical reality. And our job as scientists was to discover this object in mathematics that had the one-to-one -one relation to, to physical reality. And what occurred to me is that um, there are objects, and you can think of a few of them, which cannot possibly have a one-to-one -one relationship with an element of physical reality. And one of them is the notion of time as something that is real and continual. So you seem to have a choice there between being a realist about time or being a, a Platonist kind of realist about mathematics. And and I told Roberto, and he said something like, well, I thought you knew that. <laughs> but but um, I, I think, well, I'd love to speculate that, and I did in the book, it's true, there's a whole chapter where I try to work up a, 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 kind, a way of talking about what events are. And maybe we could go about them. Well, 
I, I, I guess I'm scared. It's hard stuff. But I, I <laughs> to talk about what events are. Well, just what mathematical. Yes, but also what physical. I see. I see. What physical events are sure.